Appendix. Observations on the end of an age. 1. The end of an age. A cartoon by von Reigen tellingly sums up an aspect of the modern mood. A bearded and unhappy prophet of doom is pictured walking the sidewalk with a picket sign bearing this grim message. We're doomed. The world will not end. The humour of this lies precisely in the fact that the end of the world is no longer a frightening fact, whereas the continuation of the present world order is. This is a mood which characterises men at the end of an era. Faith in the ability of that civilization to maintain the necessities of a bearable life, let alone fulfil its promises, is lost. The presbyter Salvian, writing in the 5th century AD, gives a vivid picture of the collapse of Roman morality and morale. Because of the decay of Rome, its citizens lost all desire to defend it. Higher and higher taxes, ever-increasing welfareism, the steady centralisation of power, the lack of justice and of morality, all these things more and more led the people increasingly to lose all desire to defend Rome. The very people who could have defended Rome, the healthy elements within the empire, finally felt they had nothing left to defend. As Salvian described it, But what else can these wretched people wish for, they who suffer the incessant and even continuous destruction of public tax levies? To them there is always imminent a heavy and relentless prescription. They desert their homes, lest they be tortured in their very homes, they seek exile, lest they suffer torture. The enemy is more lenient to them than the tax collectors. This is proved by this very fact, that they flee to the enemy in order to avoid the full force of the heavy tax levy. This very tax levying, although hard and inhuman, would nevertheless be less heavy and harsh if all would bear it equally and in common. Taxation is made more shameful and burdensome because all do not bear the burden of all. They extort tribute from the poor man for the taxes of the rich, and the weaker carry the load for the stronger. There is no reason that they cannot bear all the taxation except that the burden imposed on the wretched is greater than their resources. The Roman world was given to a sick appetite for amusement. As Salvian observed, It is dying, but continues to laugh. The Roman theatre and circus catered increasingly to a depraved taste, and the impurities of the theatre, Salvia noted, are singular in that they cannot be honestly denounced in public. Salvian was an eyewitness to the fall of Trier, and he saw the crowds continuing to cheer at the games while the raped and dying cried out in the streets. But their madness was such that a few nobles who survived destruction demanded circuses from the emperor as the greatest relief to the destroyed city. Bark, in citing Salvian's observation, has called attention to their essential accuracy. Few observers of this period of history can have failed to ponder the fact that millions of Romans were vanquished by scores of thousands of Germans. According to Salvian, it was not by the natural strength of their bodies that the barbarians conquered, nor by the weakness of their nature that the Romans were defeated. It was the Romans' moral vices alone that overcame them. 7. 108. Narrow as it is, this judgment by one very close to the event remains respectable. As for the men of more exalted position, the well-educated noblemen, who fled to the barbarians in order to escape the persecution and injustice that prevailed among the Romans, 5, 21 and 23, it is clear that they, like their poorer compatriots, had given up hope of obtaining justice and protection from the Roman state and its laws. Their flight confirms the fact that in large areas of the Western Empire, public spirit and public justice had disappeared, and that men were obliged to act privately and locally in matters that had formerly been regulated by central government authority. Rome, thus, was a society oppressed by welfareism, without faith, overtaxed, immoral, and without sufficient will to defend itself properly. 
Are these and other marks of the end of an age with us today? But first of all, what is the spirit of the modern age and why is it failing? The modern age reveals itself in no small measure by its name, modern. The concept of modernity is not common to all history. It is a belief in the relativism of all truth coupled with an evolutionary concept of man and history. Modernity means that the present moment is its own truth and that true freedom requires that the spirit of an age and of the people of that era be free to fulfil itself without reference to past laws and truths. Octavius Brooks Frothingham, 1822-1895, Unitarian and Transcendentalist, defined this humanistic faith in these terms. The interior spirit of any age is the spirit of God, and no faith can be living that has that spirit against it. No church can be strong except in that alliance. The life of the time appoints the creed of the time and modifies the establishment of the time. Thus, for Frothingham, the spirit of an age is the God of that age, and its spirit is beyond judgment by that age, being infallible and inspired because of its modernity. The roots of this faith in Hegel's philosophy are obvious, as well as its connection with modern existentialism. Existential philosophy, according to von Fersen, determines the worth of knowledge not in relation to truth, but according to its biological value contained in the pure data of consciousness when unaffected by emotions, volitions and social prejudices. Both the source and the elements of knowledge are sensations as they exist in our consciousness. There is no difference between the external and internal world, as there is no natural phenomenon which could not be examined psychologically, it all has its existence in states of the mind. Modernity thus exalts the moments because it is thereby hostile to the past and to any higher law. It is also characterized by the religious, quote, spirit of transgression, end quote, to use Bataille's phrase. This means perpetual revolution as the means to paradise. To illustrate this modernity, let us examine again a statement made on Friday, April 18, 1969, at Stanford. A mass meeting was called by the student body president to discuss the nine-day sit-in, and more than 8,000 students and faculty overflowed Frost Amphitheatre. Paul Bernstein, graduate student in political science from New York City, was one of the speakers. Bernstein, bearded, long-haired, naked to the waist, began as follows. We should not keep talking about anything, but we should look inward to ourselves. But it is not enough merely to look inward. The whole purpose of this movement has been not only to get us to look inward, to realise what our moral concerns are, but to call upon us not to sit with those moral concerns, but to take actions, so that we can still respect ourselves as human beings. This is a clear expression of modernity. Look within, not behind or above for the law. The interior spirit of the age is the law for that age. Truth and moral law mean the spirit of transgression in faithfulness to the moment. The modern era, which can also be called the age of humanism, has been rich in its promises to man, cradle to grave security, equality, a rich life for all, the abolition of poverty, ignorance, war, disease, and even death itself. Year in and year out, modern man has had the message of nearing utopia dinned into its ears. He has believed it. Man has become impatient with respect to all problems, and a revolutionary rage at delays is increasingly in evidence. This impatience is not helped by the growing collapse of the humanistic age. Material progress there has been, but man finds himself increasingly engaged in deadlier wars with the world and himself, facing deadly problems of air, earth, food and water, pollution, and progressively suicidal in his own impulses. The increasing prominence of psychology is an important sign of the times. When man becomes a problem to himself, psychology comes into its own. 
As man's inner problems grow, his ability to cope with the outer world and its problems declines. Thus, a psychology-oriented age is an age in decline, unsure of itself and inconfident in the face of its responsibilities. It is significant that modern man talks so much about alienation. His position of modernity isolates him from God and man and leaves him a prisoner of his isolated ego. Because of this alienation created by modernity, modern man reacts violently in his effort to re-establish communications, another key word. Much is said about the communications gap, about the failure of old and young to communicate, and of the inability of any man to find common ground with other men. Again, this loss of communication is a sign of the end of an age. The essential faith of an age which binds man to man has then lost its cohesive power and, as a result, communication is lost. A popular reaction to such crisis is the dropout reaction. The dropout is, in a very real sense, a true believer in his age, but he is bitter against it for its failure to deliver on its promises. As a result, he shows his bitterness by conspicuous acts of offence and non-participation in order to register his protests. At the end of the medieval era, the dropouts became non-students, commuting from university to university as a hostile force. The Goliards developed their own folk songs to register their cynicism with respect to Christian law and order and Christian morality. Similarly today, the dropouts are emphatically involved in registering their protest against the modern establishment. The dropouts is still an intense part of the modern establishment in spite of his intense protest. First, it is the real stage for him, so that he acts at all times with reference to that establishment. He demonstrates against it. He haunts the university and political world because this is the important world to him. If he creates a colony in the woods, he publicises it, invites the life photographer in, in order to pose for pictures and make sure again that the world of modernity is aware of him. Moreover, his philosophy of dropping out is simply modernity carried to its logical conclusion. As Levi observed of Sartre, the heart of Sartre's strategy for freedom is an attempt to destroy the decisiveness of the past. This means simply to cut off and drop out with respect to the past, including its institutions, the dropouts is thus more modern than the modern establishment. He is very much a part of and child to the very thing that he hates. The dropouts would resent being called past-orientated and being described as a part of the establishment, but this is the reality concerning him. He is ridden by his past, the dream of modernity, and he is a child of the modern establishment, demanding that the house be reordered by the child and heir. In contrast to the drop-outs, the drop-ins are those children of modernity who are eager to cash in on its promises and resent any rocking of the boat. A major spokesman for the drop-in mentality is Playboy. Playboy believes in the utopia of modernity, and Hugh Hefner feels himself to be the evidence of its reality. It offers a world of irresponsible sexuality, no ties of family and faith, the prospects of a lush, rich life for all, and a world of endless play and preening. The obvious success of this magazine makes it clear that a large number of people want to be drop-ins to cash in on the promises of modernity, but it is equally obvious that the magazine appeals to daydreamers who have none of these things. The non-pictorial content of Playboy is alternately conservative or radical as is needed to defend the dream. Playboy is hostile to orthodox Christianity, to legislation against non-marital sexuality, and to other similar causes which would infringe upon its dream of a sexual and social utopia. This is the radical aspect of Playboy. Its conservative phase is apparent in its hostility to higher taxes, to controls by the civil government, to inflation and to any other restrictive acts against its economic liberty. 
both phases or aspects of Playboy's editorial policy are basically in agreement in that a utopian dream is demanded by means of either emphasis. The drop-in, in effect, tells the modern age to deliver on its promises and then get out of the way. But the order being created by modernity is more than a delivery boy order. It is a drop-in order, one which delivers only to claim everything. Not the dream of liberty, but slavery to the states is the end result of the drop-in's irresponsibility. Meanwhile, the economic, political, religious, ecological and educational crises of the modern world are increasing. Every age has its problems and many eras have had more difficult problems than the modern age, but the test is the ability of a culture to cope with its problems. The modern age has lost even one of the most elementary abilities of any culture, namely the ability to discipline its children and maintain its authority. Without this elementary ability, a culture is very soon dead. The modern age gives every evidence of approaching death. This is a cause not for dismay, but for hope. The death of modernity makes possible the birth of a new culture, and such an event is always, however turbulent, an exciting and challenging venture. The dying culture loses its will to live. A new culture, grounded in a new faith, restores that will to live, even under very adverse circumstances.